time for Scriptures for America Worldwide with Pastor Peter J. Peters. All around the world, from the United States to Canada, Europe, Russia, South Africa, Australia, the Holy Spirit is stirring the hearts of godly Christians. The Bible says, quote, as an eagle stirreth up his nest, end quote. We invite you to stay tuned as Pastor Peter J. Peters shines the mighty light of the gospel on the source of our problems and the only solution. Please keep Scriptures for America in your prayers. And now, Pastor Peters. And greetings to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. If you hear the broadcast any other time, let me tell you, it's time to listen anyway. Truth is never outdated, and what you're going to hear in this broadcast is truth that people don't want to hear so much so that I think they just sometimes refuse it. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. However, how many Christians or people claiming that title really believe it? And how many really believe this passage when Jesus said in John 8:44, You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks, he speaks a lie. Now, he was a murderer from the beginning. We are in the end times and we are just beginning to believe the fact that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. How many children will be destroyed today with vaccinations? Vaccination, snake oil, administered by those who, well, I shouldn't put it that way because many administer it in good conscience, thinking they're doing good. Let me put it this way. Snake oil that's been put out there and put in our minds, by the way, that it's good for us by those that want to murder us. We have a guest for this program that I think you're going to enjoy very much. He's been in the battle a long time. But before we get to him, there are a couple things I want to do. First, I think we better pray. Our Father in heaven, I ask for the working and moving of your Holy Spirit with this broadcast, wherever it goes, whenever it goes out, that you would cause people to awaken to the truth that there is a serpentine enemy that is stealing, killing, and destroying. Help people to understand that there really are others who would not only delight in seeing their suffering and destruction of health, but prosper from it. And bless our guest for the many years that he's been in this fight and for the book that he's going to talk about that he wrote. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I said we're going to do a couple of things. Of course, prayer, one. Second thing is I want to read an end-time prophecy about murdering people. Oh, anybody can go to the Old Testament and make that thing say whatever you want, Pastor Peters. This is not Old Testament. This is a New Testament scripture that most do not see as prophecy. James chapter 5 starts out by talking to the super rich. And I want to tell you that the people we're going to be talking about are super rich. And you can read it yourself. And it says about these creatures in verse 5, You have lived luxuriously on the earth, led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Now what does that mean? That means they make money off of death. 
you have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. What does that mean? That means that, just that, they were able to put to death in such a way no one really realized that they were being put to death, and so there was no resistance. When was this? Verse 4 says it. I read, Behold, the pay of the laborer who mowed your fields, which has been withheld by you, cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. And so we see, as, as, here's the verse I want, verse 3, Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you, and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Well, enough Bible from Pastor Peters. I wanted to start out with a little bit of that before we got to our guest. And our guest is Eustace Mullins, the author of numerous books, one of which we're going to cover in this broadcast, Murder by Injection. Greetings, Mr. Mullins. Oh, greetings. Appreciate you coming on our program. Well, I'm certainly glad to be on your program again. I uh, think maybe we should start off by letting my audience know who Mr. Mullins is. You've been in this fight for a long time. Would you like to take a little bit of time right up front in the broadcast and tell how it all began as a young student? Well, you know, before the Supreme Court today is the uh, case on holding people without trial and not allowing to see the lawyers. Well, I went through that when I came into this fight in 1948 because my mentor, the Patriot Ezra Pound, was being held uh, in an insane asylum 13 and a half years without trial. Without trial. Now, you'll say that can't happen in America. It happens every day. <coughs> and uh, you don't really uh, get upset about it until it happens to you. Uh, most people, they think, well, certainly we have fair trial, we have speedy trial, it's all guaranteed by the Constitution. The, the Constitution guarantees us nothing. It's what we do for ourselves that counts. And um, so my mentor, Ezra Pound, I finally got him released 10 years later in 1958 through one congressman. Sometimes you can find one congressman who will speak up for America, and the rest are up there voting appropriations. Well, some are going to say, uh, who was Ezra Pound? Well, he was uh, the, the uh, giant of the 20th century in the terms of literature. Four of his uh, protégés became uh, winners of the Nobel Prize for Literature. There was Ernest Hemingway, T.S. Eliot, William Butler Yeats, and James Joyce. Now, no other writer <coughs> in this century has even had one protégé win the Nobel Prize for Literature, and Ezra had four. So he was way ahead of everybody. And why was he uh, targeted as an enemy? Well, he was uh, made a target because he opposed the, uh, our going into the Second World War. He pointed out correctly that it was a rerun of the First World War. Same people, Colonel House, Woodrow Wilson, everybody was right in there. And um, because he objected to war, he became a criminal. And that's the sort of thing that you run into today. Why does that not seem something new. <laughs> well, there's nothing new at all. Nothing new at all. It's happening right now before us, isn't it? Yes, and our boys are dying in Iraq today because of the Versailles Peace Conference of 1919. When the old Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Empire, broke up, the Zionists at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 broke up the Ottoman Empire into little uh, tiny Arab states, and so they would fight each other, and they've been doing it ever since. All this was done in 1919. Now, our Marines over there fighting in Baghdad today, they have no idea why they're there or how they got there, but they're fighting for their lives and they're being killed because of one man, Woodrow Wilson. He set up the policy of national self-determination, which no one understood then and no one understood now. And uh, national self-determination, apparently, uh, according to Washington, 
means having your country occupied by a foreign power under military rule. So that's uh, self-determination. Well, actually, then, uh, you and I take the risk to even put this kind of truth out. Oh, it's very risky. They'll come right after you. In days that are not <laughs> unlike the days of Ezra Pound, then, is what oh, you're yeah. saying. Oh, yeah, same thing. The FBI opened a file on me in 1948, the first time I visited Ezra Pound. Now, I was a student at an art school in Washington, D.C. I had no interest in politics of any kind. But the FBI had a file on me because Ezra was accused of treason. And that is the most dangerous accusation that can be made against anybody. And, in fact, the accusation and indictment of Ezra Pound was handled by none other than Alger Hiss the personal president of Roosevelt, and uh, the personal uh, uh, representative of uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt in the White House. Uh -huh. so, um, <clears throat> so when Alger Hiss calls you a traitor, you got to think he knows what he's talking about. Now, of course, he's the most famous traitor in American history. We've come to a time, Eustace, where there's a new generation who won't even know what we're talking about when we talk about Alger Hiss. You oh, not at all. When I went to... Washington in 1948, everybody was talking about Alger Hiss. That was the subject everywhere you went. They were arguing pro and con for Alger Hiss. Of course, ladies and gentlemen, he's the man that was a convicted communist by, uh, partly by Richard Nixon, and that's what promoted him into politics uh, as far as presidential campaign material. Oh, yes, that made him presidential material. And um, Alger Hiss also is the father of the United Nations. He wrote the United Nations Charter in San Francisco in 1945. And um, today the president and the White House says we've got to go to the United Nations. Well, then it's quite an honor for you at an early age to be identified by him as a traitor then, wasn't it? Well, yes, that was a hand of fate. There's no question about it. Yes. And Washington has considered me a traitor since 1948. I served throughout World War II in the United States Army Air Force. And, of course, that's the last war we ever won. <laughs> I understand that. Well, then, uh, back on the subject of your, uh, uh, as to what you call fate, you just sort of got into this fight for freedom by happening to go see Ezra Pound, then. Is that right? Uh, yes, I was the right place at the right time. Uh, and I've been there ever since. <laughs> and he started teaching you? He taught me three hours a day. I got an education that the whole world could envy. No one else has had it. Uh, because Ezra was not allowed to teach at an American university, so he went to Europe. And uh, American students have never had the benefit of Ezra Pound. I'm the only person in this country who has been personally educated by our greatest educator. What were some of the things he taught you? Uh, he taught me about the world conspiracy and uh, the fact that there is no nationalism. There's a a secret world government that uh, rules all countries in the world. And uh, it's done through secret societies and cabals, Kabbalah. And um, when we talk about representative government and democracy, well, we're talking hot air. There is no such thing and never has been. How did he learn that? Uh, he learned it by going to Europe as a young man and seeing firsthand the collapse of the old monarchies and uh they degenerated into what we have today, which is a government of secret societies. Interesting. Well, how many books have you written all together, Eustace? Uh, Fifteen. I've got 38 more to write. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to get them in or not. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, you've written 15, 38 more to write. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, he wrote a book that I never have gotten a hold of. I'd like to have one in my library. If any of you out there know how I could get one. I'd sure be interested. It's called The Biological Jew. And oh, uh, Pastor Peters, I found a copy uh, in my room, and I'm going to send it to you for a chance for this. Oh, wonderful. I appreciate that so very I'm much. I'm glad you brought that up because I would have probably forgotten to tell you. But I'm going to get it off to you and send it off to you. Ladies and gentlemen, the book that I have in front of me that we've carried for several years, written by Eustace, one of which I, he's written uh, and that we carry, is Murder by Injection, subtitled 
the story of the medical conspiracy against America. Uh, what does this book retail for? Uh, it's uh, twenty dollars right now. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you would write to us and send a twenty dollar offering and request it, we'll send it to you. But we'll also send you something uh, free if you want. We have a booklet that this preacher has written called "Caution Religion." Uh, excuse me, caution. Uh, vaccinations are dangerous. And our mailing address is Scriptures for America, Post Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. Eustace, do you ever feel sad some days when you get up and you think of how many people that day are going to be inoculated? Well, it's, uh, it's a death sentence, actually, because the vaccination is composed of toxins, which your system, I don't care how healthy you are and how strong you are, your system cannot get rid of that poison. It'll be there for life. And they've designed it uh, diabolically. It's a diabolical situation. Uh, they have designed a compound which, you, which your system cannot get rid of. Once it goes into your system, you've got it for life, and it'll eventually kill you. We have now a great increase uh, in... Um Alzheimer's. I think a lot of that we've discussed from the past, ladies and gentlemen, dealing with chemtrails, but I think it also has to do with they have added to these vaccinations now, particularly flu shots, additional material that uh, settles in the brain. What do you think that thought, Eustace? Oh, well, there's no question that mercury is a vehicle of the vaccinations, and it's, that's what holds these toxins in place, and mercury attacks the uh, a brain. Your first chapter is entitled The Medical Monopoly. Tell us about it. Well, I didn't know there was a medical monopoly when I started. I went to the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. to look up some material about the American Medical Association. And uh, to my amazement, I found that it's the greatest lobby in the United States, the AMA, and the most powerful lobby. And yet, there was not one book about the AMA in the Library of Congress. I couldn't believe it. I thought there'd be three or four. I'd get lots of material. There was none, so I had to sit down and write one. <laughs> I have to be forced into everything I do because there's so many things to do that uh, I had no intention of writing a book about the, the AMA, but uh, I wound up uh, doing this book, and it's been very well received. It's gone through several editions. and uh, how, how long has this book been out now? Since 1988. 88, so it's been there a fair amount of time, and you don't pull any punches. For one thing I've pointed out, Eustace, is that we live in such a deceptive society anymore. People think that schools are there to make their children smarter, when in reality they're there to make them dumber. People go to church thinking that they're going there to learn something about the Bible. What happens, they go there and are taught things to keep them learning truths that are in the Bible. And people think that cancer research is to find a cure for cancer, when in reality it's to keep a cure for cancer off the market. Would you agree oh, with that? absolutely. Most all research is for that, because God has put all, everything that we need to be healed is put in nature, and it's there for us if we'll go get it. But the medical profession is there to re prevent you from discovering uh, what will help you. So what did you discover when you started looking into this medical monopoly? Well, I found out that John D. Rockefeller, the greatest uh, monopolist in the world, uh, you know, he said God uh, gave me my money. And uh, John D. Rockefeller became the richest man in the world by uh, burning down the refineries of his competitors because he said competition is a sin. So no. he knew what sin was, and he defined it. And uh, so he was doing God's work by burning down the refineries of his competitors now because he's, they were sinning. He said God gave him his money? God gave him his money, oh, yes. Uh, um, is that right? I didn't know that. Where, where, uh, was that in a book? Have you written that in a book? Is that a quote? Is that a documented uh, uh, statement? Oh, he said that repeatedly in the interviews with newspaper men throughout his career. Uh, he, he's... He said all this just happened to him. He never did anything. He just sat back and let God give him his money. He just doesn't identify what God he's talking about, does he? <laughs> no, he doesn't. 
it's undoubtedly Lucifer because everything he did was Luciferian. And everything he's doing today, when he took over the medical system of the United States in 1913, we were the healthiest, strongest people in the world, and our health has gone down precipitously ever since then. When he took over what in 1913? Uh, the medical system of the entire United States. Uh, how did he, he changed it from homeopathy and, al and natur naturopathy to the, the German system of allopathy. Allopathic medicine uh, depends on drugs and uh, radical surgery, and it's against everything that God stands for. And that's the system we have today. We have an allopathic medical system. That's why we have these enormous medical bills, these huge medical complexes all over the United States. They're like citadels. Yeah, in fact, um, they have been written along those terms as temples. They are temples, yes. Uh, yes, and uh, the surgeries are uh, rated on the basis of blood. It's like a blood sacrifice. Well, it's a blood sacrifice. Actually, you draw blood. That's uh, and in fact, um, the the uh, heathen <coughs> believe in drawing blood from Christians, and everything you do. In a hospital, the first thing I do is draw blood. Now, you mentioned something about what people were like in 1913 as far as health goes. One thing that I uh, like to do sometimes is get an old movie, Eustace. Uh, not that it's anything I'm interested in, but I'm talking about something that goes back in the 30s or 40s. And sit there and look at the people, you know, that are crossing the street, coming into the hotel lobby. They were very healthy, very strong, robust. It was just a natural thing. Oh, it shone out of them, and you could see the way they walked and the way they talked, and it's all there right on the screen in front of you. And then compare it to today, it's quite an uh, eye-opener, isn't it? Oh, it really is. And but, to the children today are overweight and listless, and they have no motivation whatsoever. It's pathetic. Yes. Do you remember the days when uh, on a Saturday morning, I remember here few years ago on a Saturday morning in a little town in Ohio, there was snow coming down and I was driving down the streets and it occurred to me there were no children anywhere. Hmm. I remember on a snowy day, children in the streets with their sleds and playing snowballs and, and like you said, robust. Uh, we don't see that in America like we once did. And it, one of it is that uh, they are not nearly as healthy as they were. No, they're not, because they're sitting at home watching television, watching Howdy Doody and Mr. Rogers and all these fake programs that uh, supposedly are for children. Right, which throws them on right brain thinking, which is a whole other subject. Uh, well, back to the subject at hand. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking to Eustace Mullins, the author of Murder by Injection story of the medical conspiracy in America, and if you'd like to order this book, it's one you ought to have if you're thinking about vaccinating your children or, well, even the elderly getting in line for their flu shots. You can write to us at Scriptures for America, Post Office Box 766, LaPorte, Colorado, 80535. Send a $20 offering, and we'll send it to you. Let me read the chapters. The Medical Monopoly, Quacks on Quackery, The Prophets of Cancer, Death and Vaccination, The Fluoridation Conspiracy, Wither AIDS, The Action of Fertilizers, Contamination of the Food Supply, The Drug Trust, The Rockefeller Syndicate. Which one of those points do you want to talk about next, Eustace? Well, the Rock it all comes from the Rockefeller Center Syndicate. In 1913, three of Rockefeller's assistants, the, the three Flexner brothers, Abraham Flexman and Simon and Bernard, uh, Rockefeller appointed them to revamp the entire medical system of the United States. They were going to move it from uh, naturopathy to allopathic, uh, the German system. And they did. They got the legislatures to close down the medical schools and to, to reopen them under Rockefeller's direction, and they've done that ever since. I don't think people realize that 
it's so strong that if a doctor did find a treatment that was of benefit to his patient, if it didn't fit in with the training or what they call orthodox medicine, he can't use it or he risks losing everything, doesn't he? Oh, yes. In fact, doctors have just drummed out of the AMA for curing people, uh, for using what they call unapproved. You see, approval is everything. The American Medical Association uh, puts out a list of approved medicines. You cannot use anything that's not on an approval list. It's a, uh, it's a really a Soviet system is all it is. With the regards to the subject of cancer, they've gone to the extent from what I have looked into this subject that there has been more than one cancer cure that's come along and as a result, there's been more than one that's gone to jail or to the grave as a result of it. Would you? Oh, they've had them right to death. They, they don't let up on you because it's the most profitable of the entire medical industry. So, uh, and I quote in my book, Murder by Injection, a doctor in 1936 stated, I have never found a cancer where the patient had not been vaccinated. Yes. Okay. That, isn't that interesting? Um, is that in your book here? It's in the book. And nobody else, no other doctor has ever made that statement. But that is the truest statement that I have ever run into in my research. Absolutely borne out by the facts. Well, let's if you have not been vaccinated, you'll never have cancer. Let's go back to 1913. Cancer was almost unheard of at that time. Oh, oh yes, very rare. It was called an old people's disease. Yes, because it was a degeneration of the tissue. That's the only way you could get cancer. When you got so old that your tissues no longer could defend themselves. And now we have actually, I understand, uh, well, of course, we have children with cancer, but I understand sometimes we have babies born with it. I didn't know that, but uh, it's not surprising at all. Well, don't take that as gospel, but at least we do know children get cancer, and that was not the case. Well, not that's the most horrible thing of all, that children have cancer, and the treatment of children with cancer, you see these poor children with uh, bald head, you know, the hair is gone. Yes. And uh, they're condemned to an early death. And ladies and gentlemen, if you've heard Pastor Peter's preaching about the people or the creatures that Jesus spoke of in Matthew chapter 23, you've heard me speak the unspeakable, that perhaps there are those that not only profit off of such a thing, but actually get devilish, satanic glee and delight out of suffering. That's my position on that, Eustace. I don't know about yours. Well, it certainly is. You know, Christ said, uh, suffer the little children to come to me, and what we have done is turned our children over to the doctors to kill them. Well, speaking of children, and one of the things in your, uh, your book, Chapter 5, The Fluoridation Conspiracy, Oh, yeah. Someone sent me this. I'm holding it in my hand right now. I wish you could see it. It's um, it's a little coupon, and it's got, uh, it says, save $1.25 on any one multi-pack of kid-sized Dannon water. And... Uh, they got a little picture of this six-pack of Dannon water, and it's got a big, it's got a couple of funny-looking little uh, cartoon characters on it, and the big black letter word fluoride. And I thought, can you imagine that? People are actually buying six packs of special water that's been especially fluoridated for their little children. And, of course, Dannon would be uh, a good word for it. It's very close to uh, to demon. Oh, it certainly is. Demon very water. Demonic. Uh, there is a demonic influence behind all these things, and I warn people that in my book, Curse of Canaan, that uh, there's a demonic presence on the earth. Yes, indeed. And I think people are... Be uh, well, let me ask you this, Eustace. You've been in this fight a lot longer than I. Uh, do you mind stating your age? Oh, I'm 80. I'm going on 82. Going on 82. So you've been I'm busier than ever. I work seven days a week, and um, you know they're finally saying 
that uh, most of the problem with people is they're not active enough. That's absolutely true. You've got to keep going. And I've been blessed that I have so much work to do that I'll stay busy forever. I'm sorry about that. I had to take care of a little. What did you say the last point? I say I've been blessed by having so much work to do. Yes. Well, now, have you noticed, though, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, for myself, and I'm hardly dry behind the ears compared to you. I started out in this when I was a teenager during the Johnson Goldwater campaign. Someone gave me a book called None Dare Call It Treason. And uh, in those days, the enemy were communists. Oh, yes, yeah. anti-communists. I started out as anti-communist. <laughs> I learned better than that. Well, yeah, we learn as we go on, don't we? Yes. Yeah. But uh, I was thinking of the different terms that we've had. Uh, we've had uh, the communists and socialists, and then there's the New World Order uh, the people and the, the liberals. And, and I've begun to, uh, as I've gone on in this, what I call, 40 years of wilderness wondering, wondering why we're always losing, to realize that uh, this is all spiritual and demonic, and these are demonic creatures. That's what I've come to in my quest for truth. Uh, give me your thoughts on that. Well, that, that really opens up the whole territory, because then you begin to understand what is going on. We fought communism for years, and uh, communism finally collapsed when we stopped supporting it, because all the time we were fighting communism, we were supporting communism. <laughs> so when we stopped supporting communism, it collapsed. And that's true of all these things. Uh, the demons can keep these things going, but only if they enlist us in their campaign. So you've come to that uh, position uh, as well then? Oh, yeah. yeah. Because I found out through my research over 60 years that I was running into the same types of people in every uh, conspiracy that I ran into. A very consistent pattern. Elaborate on that, please. Because, well, the, I, I started out, again, I was an anti-communist, and I, I was started out on the, on the monetary conspiracy of taking over the money and credit of the people of the United States and using it against them. And I found out that the same people popped up every time, that uh, there were dynasties whose entire families worked on these things, like the Rockefeller dynasty, and... Uh, the Warburgs and the Schiffs. You know, Albert Gore, our vice president of the Clinton, his daughter married into the Schiff fortune. That's how tightly controlled everything is. Give us your thoughts concerning uh, our wonderful choice given to us today between Mr. Uh, Bush and Mr. Kerry. Well, it's been pointed out for the first time we have two members of Skull and Bones that they are running against each other, which is absolutely forbidden because under Skull and Bones uh, directive, you're absolutely supposed to support your uh, fraternity brothers, never fight with them. So this is a uh, uh, heresy of some kind. Well, is it or is it a show and it's already arranged and it really is not a fight? It's a charade. It's a charade all the way. Uh-huh. There's no fight whatsoever. And we have this uh, this man of the people, John Kerry. Now, in the paper this morning, it talked about his $6 uh, million dollar homes. He has $6 million dollar homes to live in. He's a man, a true man of the people. You know, most Americans don't have $1 million dollar home. Now, he married the Heinz fortune, uh, $700 million. And uh, we had a, a good patriotic senator named Senator Heinz and he died mysteriously in a plane crash. And up pops John Kerry and immediately marries his widow, who's from Madagascar. I don't know what her origins are, but uh, she's something from Madagascar. Uh, she's she's she Jewish, sudden, of course. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Oh, and uh, after this mysterious death of Senator Hines, John Kerry becomes one of the richest men in the United States. In fact... Uh, uh, a man said on television the other day that John Kerry is a great speech master, and the greatest speech he ever made was when he said, I do. 
I think I'll open up the phone lines, and our guest, ladies and gentlemen, Eustace Mullins, author of numerous books, one of which I'm holding in my hand, I'd like to put in your hand, called Murder by Injection, the Story of the Medical Conspiracy Against America. And if you'd like to call and speak to him or myself with comment or question, the number is 307-745-5913. Hello, this is Pastor Peters. You're on the air. Hi, Pastor Pete. Um, I've got a question for um, Eustace read some of his books, really admire him. Um, recently I've been diagnosed with high blood pressure, and what they do is they put you on a diuretic first to try to, to lower that. And I'd like to find out from him if he knows if that is really a good thing to do or not. Well, the, the uh, diuretic is hydrochlorothiazide, and they have found out that if you take hydrochlorothiazide over a period of time, it affects your heart. It gives you a serious heart condition. So they've been kind of easing off on that in the last few years. But uh, there is a definite uh, impairment of the heart in the use of that drug. Okay, so what should someone do if, if they do have, and I don't even know for sure if if the high blood pressure that, you know, they're saying is too high, if that's correct or not. What What is a, a proper blood pressure? Well, they keep changing those um, uh, numbers, like uh, cholesterol was... Uh, it was too high at 300, and now it's too high at 200. They keep shifting the numbers around, so you never know what to count on. But do you have an opinion at what would be a normal, I mean, like like if you get to be, you know, 190 over 90 or something, is that too high, or is that? Oh, that's too high, definitely. Okay. And um, you have to watch that by a diet. They say you control your intake of salt. Yeah, is that true? Well, uh, there have been arguments about that, but... Uh, Apparently, it's better to limit your intake of salt. I tell you what, I'll have Ken Anderson maybe next week give us a call, and you can ask him, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. 307-745-5913. You know, uh, Eustace, uh, you could go to jail for what you just said. Well, I'm prescribing, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that over the phone for years. I, I give people legal advice over the telephone health advice over the telephone, no one has ever opened their mouth to me about it. But point being, ladies and gentlemen, this is supposed to be a free country, but people do go to jail for doing just that. Ken Anderson went to jail for helping people doing just exactly what you heard here. Hello, this is Pastor Peters. You're on the air. Hello, Pastor Pete. This is Rich from East Coast. Good morning, Rich. morning. Uh, I have a question um, about... The, uh, all the vasectomies that were done um, over the years. And I, uh, according to the scriptures, uh, you know, it mentions bruised stones and uh, not entering the kingdom of God with it. And uh, I'd like to have your feelings on that and uh, vasectomy reversals and how that lines up with, uh, with Eustace and yourself. All right. Now hang up. Thank you. You bet. 307-745-5913, my recommendation, obviously, is don't do it. They want to keep God's people from being fruitful and multiplying, and it's incredible uh, how many have done it. Once it's done, uh, I would say just the grace of God covers and be in prayer about it if you... Uh, want to have it reversed that's your that's your call um, and I'd have to think about it a little bit more but that would be my off the cuff answer right there this is Pastor Peters you're on the air yes sir good morning gentlemen uh, this is Mike out in Virginia um, it's a real pleasure to listen to your guest this morning I've read uh, his book Curse of Canaan and I would highly recommend it to people so they'll understand actually the spirit get a better understanding, I should say, of the spiritual warfare that they're up against and who they're up against. Um, I'm halfway through the book, Murder by Injection, and it's a, it's a very good book also. And I'd like to expound real quickly on two points he made. Um, first one um, being John D. Rockefeller, and I believe it's in one of his books, and I run across also in other history books, is John D. Rockefeller was actually at one time a snake oil salesman. He actually peddled poison uh, 
actually traveling show that I believe it was kerosene, basically it was a uh, mineral oil derivative, and um, he actually peddled the poison to people knowing that it would kill them. And personally, I believe it was to pay his allegiance to his money masters, which out of Europe, I believe the Rockefellers are a representative of the Rothschild banking family. And um, just one other point you made, uh, your guest there made early on in the uh, interview, was that uh, World War II was the last war we won. And I've been trying to make this point. I live outside Norfolk, Virginia, which is a major military town, and it's absolutely Jewish controlled. The uh, universities, the media, except everything, and uh, you know they're pushing this war over there in the Middle East, slaughtering the Caucasian people's children. It's really horrible. But uh, anyway, the point I was uh, going to expound on, being that World War II is the last war we won, quote unquote. Uh, I, I try to real quickly put the people is. I ask them, well, how many wars have we been in since the end of World War II? And I follow that up real quickly with how many have we won, and it always stuns them when they realize, well, we haven't won any. And then I follow that up with, well, what makes you think we're going to win this one? And that's when I look at them and tell them, well, it's television, and now you know why they call it programming. And it, and it stuns people. It just, I watch your jaws drop, and if you'd like to comment or whatever, but I sure appreciate your show or your program, Pastor Peter, and uh, your guest this morning. It's an honor to listen to him. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for calling. You want to comment on that, Eustace? Well, it's true that we're programmed with everything that we do, the television and the newspapers. You don't get any news from the newspapers. You get propaganda. And uh, that's all uh, planned from above. I wrote in one of my books that all every uh, evening news program, ABC, CBS, NBC, is uh, checked in London by the uh, Secret Intelligence Service of England, before the evening news can come on in the United States. And you'll find that all three programs are exactly like They have the same stories on every night. Right. Uh, that's so there has to be a central control there, and that control is not even in the United States. It's in London. This is Pastor Peters. You're on the air. Hello. Hello, Pastor Peters. Yes. This is Suzanne from New York. Um, Pastor Peters, um, it is very disturbing to hear all this conspiracy about the um, health system that's going on in this whole world. Um, would you be so kind and pray for his people, um, the Lord's remnant, and put his protective shield over all of us? Um, unknowingly, we gave vaccinations to our children or have been vaccinated ourselves. That would be such a blessing to all of us. And I will hang up and listen to your prayer. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Eustace, I'm sure you'll join me as we pray. Yes, indeed. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this wise call that came. And Father, thank you for your spirit that was laying that very conviction on my heart prior to it coming. Thank you, Father, for letting us know that we have a God that is so great that he can cure and that he can nullify the plans of the adversary. And, Father, thank you for letting us know that your Son is not only our King, but our great physician. And, oh, Father, I pray that there would be an outpouring of your Holy Spirit across this land and an awakening where your people would once again look. Look as they did in the days of Moses when that bronze serpent was lifted up on the staff that Jesus said represented him, and look to it and pray and say, Heal us from these snake bites, Father. And, Father, I thank you that we are going to see that outpouring as we even see parts of it now in places that we've never seen it before. I thank you that we're seeing an opening of eyes that we've never seen before. I thank you, Father, that you've made it clear that these hell hounds, these serpent sons of hell, will be stomped back into their demonic holes where they belong. And I speak against them now in the name of Jesus Christ, with the armor of God wearing it in conjunction with other brothers and sisters. I speak, Father, and speak your word. Let those who would dare to touch your anointed, let those that would dare to destroy your church know that you destroy them when we call upon you. And so we call upon you, Father. 
multiply over the misery and the wickedness and bring it upon their heads and loose it from your people. And Father, grant that faith to your people that if they but look to Christ their healer, that they can have not only the redemption from sin, but redemption from their enemies and healing of their bodies, a renewal of health. And Father, we pray for the miracle working power that was manifest in the first century, even now upon your saints and that elect that would tend to have fear. We come against that fear in the name of Jesus Christ. We bind you. We we cast you out and you, you be gone. You be gone from the hearts and the minds of your people. This wicked fear. And Father, we know that you've told us that if we refuse to fear them, that it comes back upon them. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up. We speak now the power and the force against our enemies. For we are helpless and powerless without you. We confess to you the sins, our own sins and the sins of our fathers that have brought upon us the snakes as a result of your punishment upon us. And now, Father, we look to the cross and we pray, remove them from us. Expose them and let them be gone. You've told us, Lord, that if we have faith, we could speak to a mountain and it would be gone into the sea. And so we speak against the Mount of Esau and we say, be gone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sorry for the lengthy prayer there. Uh, are you still there, Eustace? Oh, yes. Uh, that was very touching. I uh, I would like to remind the people also of the last chapter of Matthew. Christ says, I am with you always. And he spelled that A-L-L-W-A-Y-S. And Christ is with us always. That is his word. Amen. And we have, we have to acknowledge his presence. And Christ is a presence that is always with us if we acknowledge him. But we, so many of us are in ignorance of that fact. We don't know that Christ is with us, but there he, he's right here with us all the time. And that's how we can, that's how we survive. Amen. Greater is he that is for us than he that is against us. Yes. They would love us to fear them. And ladies and gentlemen, scripture comes to my mind. I turned it right here to Second Thessalonians 1, verse 6. Take comfort in it. Pray it. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. Hallelujah. Hello, this is Pastor Peters. You're on the air. Uh, good morning, Pastor, and good morning, Eustace. Good morning. Uh, this is Kate from Linwood, New Jersey. Oh, yes. How are you? Oh, fine. Uh, I wanted to tell uh, the pastor that I have all your books and even the biological Jew. Uh, also, the only one I don't have is the, my life in Christ. I think yeah, I'm replanting that. Uh, 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 what I'm saying is that I enjoy and I find your monographs very informative. And the most one that I think should be brought out is about how the Jews invented lobotomies, which they take an ice pick and put in the forehead of the patient so they lose their memory. And uh, that beautiful actress, Frances Farmer, that was totally destroyed uh, by the Jewish monopoly. Uh, maybe you could speak about that, Eustace? Thank you. Oh, yes. Thank uh, you. Well, when I went to school in Washington, D.C., one of my fellow students was a lady who had had a lobotomy. And believe it or not, she worked at the White House. And uh, her mind was completely gone. But she knew that something had been done to her. If you have a lobotomy, you still are conscious that you have been uh, ultimately sabotaged and you can never recover from it. And that's a terrible way to live. You mean uh, she had a lobotomy after she worked at the White House? Before she worked at the White House. 
I guess that was her qualification. <laughs> really, I, I was thinking that a lobotomy caused a person to be more or less a, a vegetable. Oh, no. They can, uh, they can be vegetables, but only in certain mental processes. They can carry on a normal life uh, outside of that. Think of what they've done to people with their electric shock. Well, everything, to me, the most horrible phrase in the English language is invasive surgery. Because when somebody comes at you with a knife, they're going to do you harm. And uh, invasive surgery is the basis of allopathic medicine. came right out to Germany. And that, that's what's wrong with people today. Today, ladies and gentlemen, our guest is Eustace Mullins, author of many books, one of which we uh, like to put in your hand, Murder by Injection. You can order it from us in a $20 offering. To Scriptures for America, Post Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. Or if you would like to also, and or, let me put it that way, we have a little booklet called Vaccinations Are Dangerous. We'll send that to you for free if you want to write to us. And uh, let us know what program you heard it on. Hello, this is Pastor Peters. You're on the air. Yes, good morning. Uh, and good morning to Eustace. I'm calling from New York. Um, I'm looking, I have a picture in the New York Post. It's a picture of our troops, uh, our American troops that are being moved from one location in Iraq to another. And these boys, they're all Caucasian. They're all white. I see one Hispanic in there, I think. But uh, you see them with the blonde hair. They're all white. I'm wondering, aside from the medical profession, does, I want to know what Eustace thinks. Um, is, isn't this another way to thin out the white population? I'll take the, the answer off the air. Let's see both. Well, this is genocide. That's all it is, genocide. And you can, when they called up the National Guard, they called up the heartland of America, and those are the American boys that are fighting in Iraq today. I have noticed that there's a disproportionate number of whites in the front lines. The uh, supply lines and things like that are different, but uh, as far as the combatant, it does seem that the caller is right on that. Well, and the, uh, there's a disproportionate number from what is called the heartland. There's very few uh, of these troops are from Philadelphia and New York City. I hadn't thought about that. Uh, uh, they're not there. Uh, this is Pastor Peters. You're on the air. Hi, good morning. Uh, Pastor Peters and Yusuf Mullins. Good morning. Good yeah, morning. you know, I wanted to add on a comment about um, the vaccinations and that uh, the poison that's in the body. I remember reading in uh, the Paul Bragg books about fasting that in his experiences uh, he had one where he had a urination that was burning, and he stated that it was the, the mercury coming out of his body. Yeah. And he, you know, he had quite a regimen of four weeks a, um, a year fasting and one day a week. Well, you know, I want to, um, I'm going to tell, uh, thank you for calling, sir. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you that we carry a book called Christ the Healer, and that's really where it's all at, uh, at at this point. There's so much poison in our society. And remember that Jesus said in Mark 16, verse 18, um, they, if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. He is our great physician. And we are to the place now that we've got to go beyond the physical. There are physical remedies to, uh, just like the man's talking about there, fasting and cleansing. And I'm not saying not to do that, but we've got to go into that realm, just as we've gone into the realm dealing with the conspiracy, that we're dealing with something satanic, demonic. We've got to go into the realm the angelic realm of Christ the healer and start walking in faith again. Uh, I know a man that was poisoned, and when he was standing there urinating blood, it finally came to him through the Holy Spirit what had happened. He could hardly speak, couldn't think very fast, and he just said, by his stripes I am healed. And he started standing on that and requesting prayer, and he was healed. So have faith again, my friends, uh, because faith is the victory. It's the ultimate victory. I wanted to say that. And Eustace, we're going to let you say a few words because we only got a couple minutes left. And I'd like—I have a feeling you got so much more to say that we need to have you back on. Would you be willing to come back on? 
Well, yes, I'll be able to do that. That's true. I can hardly get started in an hour. You know, for 10 years, I lectured at the National Health Federation annual meetings because they were doing some good work, and they finally went over to a bunch of uh, uh, quack remedies, and uh, they uh, banned me from speaking there. I haven't spoken there in the last 10 years. Well, Eustace, uh, why don't I sometimes just schedule and let you lecture I'm, I'm uh, on whatever you feel the, like you want to lecture on and, and lecture Pastor Peters and the audience because, you know, I was sitting here thinking how foolish of someone like Pastor Peters to have uh, access to uh, Eustace Mullins as he had access to Ezra Pound and not get more teaching from him. Well, I have a number of lectures which I've delivered over the years. One is on the legal system. One is on the monetary system, and one is on the medical system. And there's just so much that Ezra Pound taught me in those years at St. Elizabeth. You know, I got my education at the insane asylum. <laughs> and they always call me a conspiratologist because I talk about conspiracy. But uh, you're not going to get very far if you don't encounter the conspiracy of Satan. And that's what it is. Yes, indeed. Well, okay. So what are our choices here? Um Money, medical, uh, uh, law. Law, okay. There is a law. <laughs> All right. Well, let's plan on having you back. Would you be willing to do so maybe next week? Uh, next week at the same time would be very good. Would it be? All right. Yeah. Then let's plan on it, okay? All right. I'll put it on my calendar. Sir, thank you so very much for right. being with us today. It's my privilege. Goodbye. Goodbye. And course the privilege was mine it's ours and keep him and me in your prayers let us pray our father I do pray for your blessings upon this brave man that we had as a guest and upon your saints throughout this land that you bless them and keep them make your face shine upon them and be gracious to them lift your countenance upon them and grant them peace in Jesus' name, amen. You have been listening to Scriptures for America Worldwide with Pastor Peter J. Peters. Should you want to write, the address is Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535, USA. Our fax number is country code 01-307-745-5914. Again, that is Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535, USA. Fax number 01-307-745-5914. When writing, please let us know on which broadcast frequency you received this program. Scriptures for America Worldwide is an evangelical ministry dedicated to proclaiming the correct gospel of the kingdom of Christ and to revealing to the world the true scriptural identity of the true covenant people. The Bible says, quote, creation groans for the revealing of the sons of God, end quote. This ministry is supported by tithes and free will offerings. Please pray for Scriptures for America Worldwide. time for Scriptures for America Worldwide with Pastor Peter J. Peters. All around the world, from the United States to Canada, Europe, Russia, South Africa, Australia, the Holy Spirit is stirring the hearts of godly Christians. The Bible says, quote, as an eagle stirreth up his nest, end quote. We invite you to stay tuned as Pastor Peter J. Peters shines the mighty light of the gospel on the source of our problems and the only solution. Please keep Scriptures for America in your prayers. And now, Pastor Peters. And greetings to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. If you hear the broadcast any other time, let me tell you, it's time to listen anyway. Truth is never outdated, and what you're going to hear in this broadcast is truth that people don't want to hear so much so that I think they just sometimes refuse it. Jesus said 
the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. However, how many Christians or people claiming that title really believe it? And how many really believe this passage when Jesus said in John 8:44, You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks, he speaks a lie. Now, he was a murderer from the beginning. We are in the end times, and we are just beginning to believe the fact that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. How many children will be destroyed today with vaccinations? Vaccination, snake oil, administered by those who, well, I shouldn't put it that way because many administer it in good conscience thinking they're doing good. Let me put it this way. Snake oil that's been put out there and put in our minds, by the way, that it's good for us by those that want to murder us. We have a guest for this program that I think you're going to enjoy very much. He's been in the battle a long time. But before we get to him, there are a couple things I want to do. First, I think we better pray. Our Father in heaven, I ask for the working and moving of your Holy Spirit with this broadcast, wherever it goes, whenever it goes out, that you would cause people to awaken to the truth that there is a serpentine enemy that is stealing, killing, and destroying. Help people to understand that there really are others who would not only delight in seeing their suffering and destruction of health, but prosper from it. And bless our guest for the many years that he's been in this fight and for the book that he's going to talk about that he wrote. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I said we're going to do a couple of things. Of course, prayer, one. Second thing is I want to read an end-time prophecy about murdering people. Oh, anybody can go to the Old Testament and make that thing say whatever you want, Pastor Peters. This is not Old Testament. This is a New Testament scripture that most do not see as prophecy. James chapter 5 starts out by talking to the super rich. And I want to tell you that the people we're going to be talking about are super rich. And you can read it yourself. And it says about these creatures. In verse 5, you have lived luxuriously on the earth, led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Now, what does that mean? That means they make before. Uh, it's uh, $20 right now. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you would write to us and send a $20 offering and request it, we'll send it to you. But we'll also send you something uh, free if you want. We have a booklet that this preacher has written called Caution Religion. Uh, excuse me, Caution. Uh, vaccinations are dangerous. And our mailing address is Scriptures for America, Post Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. Eustace, do you ever? feel sad some days when you get up and you think of how many people that day are going to be inoculated? Well, it's, uh, it's a death sentence, actually, because the vaccination is composed of toxins, which your system, I don't care how healthy you are and how strong you are, your system cannot get rid of that poison. It'll be there for life. And they've designed it uh, diabolically. It's a diabolical situation. Uh, they have designed... A compound which, uh, which your system cannot get rid of. 
Once it goes into your system, you've got it for life, and it'll eventually kill you. We have now a great increase uh, in um, Alzheimer's. I think a lot of that we've discussed from the past, ladies and gentlemen, dealing with chemtrails, but I think it also has to do with they have added to these vaccinations now, particularly flu shots, additional material that uh, settles in the brain. What do you think that thought, Eustace? Oh, well, there's no question. Mercury is a vehicle of the vaccinations, and it's, that's what holds these toxins in place. And mercury attacks the uh, brain. Your first chapter is entitled The Medical Monopoly. Tell us about it. Well, I didn't know there was a medical monopoly when I started. I went to the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. to look up some material about the American Medical Association. And uh, to my amazement, I found that it's the greatest lobby in the United States, the AMA, and the most powerful lobby. And yet, there was not one book about the AMA in the Library of Congress. I couldn't believe it. I thought there'd be three or four. I'd get lots of material. There was none, so I had to sit down and write one. I have to be forced into everything I do because there's so many things to do that uh, I had no intention of writing a book about the AMA, but uh, I wound up uh, doing this book, and it's been very well received. It's gone through several editions. and uh, how, how long has this book been out now? Since 1988. 88, so it's been there a fair amount of time, and you don't pull any punches. For one thing I've pointed out, Eustace, is that we live in such a deceptive society anymore People think that schools are there to make their children smarter, when in reality they're there to make them dumber. People go to church thinking that they're going there to learn something about the Bible. What happens, they go there and are taught things to keep them learning truths that are in the Bible. And people think that cancer research is to find a cure for cancer when in reality it's to keep a cure for cancer off the market. Would you agree oh, with that? absolutely. Most all research is for that because God has put all, everything that we need to be healed is put in nature, and it's there for us if we'll go get it. But the medical profession is there to re prevent you from discovering uh, what will help you. So what did you discover when you started looking into this medical monopoly? Well, I found out that John D. Rockefeller, the greatest uh, monopolist in the world, uh, you know, he said God uh, gave him my money. And uh, John D. Rockefeller became the richest man in the world by uh, burning down the refineries of his competitors because he said competition is a sin. So yep. he knew what sin was, and he defined it. And uh, so... He was doing God's work by burning down the refineries of his competitors now, he's, because they were sinning. He said God gave him his money? God gave him his money. Oh, yes. Uh, um, is that right? I didn't know that. Where, where, uh, was that in a book? Have you written that in a book? Is that a quote? Is that a documented uh, uh, statement? Oh, he said that repeatedly in the interviews with newspaper men throughout his career. Uh, he, he, he said all this just happened to him. He never did anything. He just sat back and let God give him his money. He just doesn't identify what God he's talking about, does he? <laughs> no, he doesn't. It's undoubtedly Lucifer because everything he did was Luciferian. And everything he's doing today, when he took over the medical system of the United States in 1913, we were the healthiest, strongest people in the world, and our health has gone down precipitously ever since then. When he took over what in 1913? Uh, the medical system of the entire United States. Uh, how did he, he changed do? it from homeopathy and, and natural naturopathy to the, the German system of allopathy. Allopathic medicine uh, depends on drugs and uh, radical surgery, and it's against everything that God stands for. And that's the system we have today. We have an allopathic medical system. That's why we have these enormous medical bills, these huge medical complexes all over the United States, they're like citadels. Yeah, in fact, um, they have been written along those terms as temples. They are temples, yes. Uh, yes, and uh, the surgeries are uh, rated on the basis of blood. It's like a blood sacrifice. Well, it's a blood sacrifice. That's what you draw blood. That's, uh, and, in fact, um, the, the uh, heathen 
<coughs> believe in drawing blood from Christians. And everything you do in a hospital, the first thing you do is draw blood. Now, you mentioned something about what people were like in 1913 as far as health goes. One thing that I uh, like to do sometimes is get an old movie, Eustace. Uh, not that it's anything I'm interested in, but I'm talking about something that goes back in the 30s or 40s. And sit there and look at the people, you know, that are crossing the street, coming into the hotel lobby. They were very healthy, very strong, robust. It was just a natural thing. Oh, it shone out of them, and you could see the way they walked and the way they talked. And it's all there, right on the screen in front of you. And then compare it to today, it's quite an uh, eye-opener, isn't it? Oh, it really is. But and to the children today are overweight and listless, and they have no motivation whatsoever. It's pathetic. Yes. Do you remember the days when, uh, on a Saturday morning, I remember here a few years ago, on a Saturday morning in a little town in Ohio, there was snow coming down, and I was driving down the streets, and it occurred to me, there were no children anywhere. Hmm. I remember on a snowy day, children in the streets with their sleds and playing snowballs and, and like you said, robust. Uh, we don't see that in America like we once did. And it, one of it is that uh, they are not nearly as healthy as they were. No, they're not, because they're sitting at home watching television, watching Howdy Doody, and Mr. Rogers and all these fake programs that uh, supposedly are for children. Right, which throws them on right brain thinking, which is a whole other subject. Uh, well, back to the subject at hand. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking to Eustace Mullins, the author of Murder by Injection, Story of the Medical Conspiracy in America. And if you'd like to order this book, it's one you ought to have. If you're thinking about vaccinating your children, or, well, even the elderly getting in line for their flu shots. You can write to us at Scriptures for America, Post Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. Send a $20 offering and we'll send it to you. Let me read the chapters. The Medical Monopoly, Quacks on Quackery, The Prophets of Cancer, Death and Vaccination, the Floridation Conspiracy, Wither AIDS, The Action of Fertilizers, Contamination of the Food Supply, The Drug Trust, The Rockefeller Syndicate. Which one of those points do you want to talk about next, Eustace? Well, the Rock it all comes from the Rockefeller Center Syndicate. In 1913, three of Rockefeller's assistants, the, the three Flexner brothers, Abraham Flexman and Simon and Bernard, uh, Rockefeller appointed them to revamp the entire medical system of the United States. They were going to move it from uh, naturopathy to allopathic, uh, the German system. And they did. They got the legislatures to close down the medical schools and uh, to reopen them under Rockefeller's direction. And they've done that ever since. I don't think people realize that it's so strong that if a doctor did find a treatment that was a benefit to his patient, if it didn't fit in with the training or what they call orthodox money off of death, you have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. What does that mean? That means that just that, they were able to put to death in such a way no one really realized that they were being put to death, and so there was no resistance. When was this? Verse 4 says it. I read, Behold, the pay of the laborer who mowed your fields, which has been withheld by you, cries out against you, and the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. And so we see, uh, here's the verse I want, verse 3, Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you, 
It will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Well, enough Bible from Pastor Peters. I wanted to start out with a little bit of that before we got to our guest. And our guest is Eustace Mullins, the author of numerous books, one of which we're going to cover in this broadcast, Murder by Injection. Greetings, Mr. Mullins. Oh, greetings. Appreciate you coming on our program. Well, I'm certainly glad to be on your program again. I uh, think maybe we should start off by letting my audience know who Mr. Mullins is. You've been in this fight for a long time. Would you like to take a little bit of time right up front in the broadcast and tell how it all began as a young student? Well, you know, before the Supreme Court today is the uh, case on holding people without trial and not allowing to see the lawyers. Well, I went through that when I came into this fight in 1948 because my mentor, the Patriot Ezra Pound, was being held uh, in an insane asylum 13 and a half years without trial. Without trial. Now, you'll say that can't happen in America. It happens every day. <coughs> and uh, you don't really uh, get upset about it until it happens to you. Uh, most people, they think, well, Certainly we have fair trial, we have speedy trial, it's all guaranteed by the Constitution. The the Constitution guarantees us nothing. It's what we do for ourselves that counts. And um, so my mentor, Ezra Pound, I finally got him released 10 years later in 1958 through one congressman. Sometimes you can find one congressman who will speak up for America and the rest are up there voting appropriations. Well, some are going to say, uh, who was Ezra Pound? Well, he was uh, the, the uh, giant of the 20th century in the terms of literature. Four of his uh, protégés became uh, winners of the Nobel Prize for Literature. There was Ernest Hemingway, T.S. Eliot, William Butler Yeats, and James Joyce. Now, no other writer <coughs> in this century has even had one protégé win the Nobel Prize for Literature, and Ezra had four, so he was way ahead of everybody. And why was he uh, targeted as an enemy? Well, he was uh, made a target because he opposed the, uh, our going into the Second World War. He pointed out correctly that it was a rerun of the First World War. Same people, Colonel House, Woodrow Wilson, everybody was right in there. And um, because he objected to war, he became a criminal. And that's the sort of thing that you run into today. Why does that not seem something new? <laughs> well, there's nothing new at all. <laughs> nothing new at all. It's happening right now before us, isn't it? Yes, and our boys are dying in Iraq today because of the Versailles Peace Conference of 1919. When the old Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Empire, broke up, the Zionists at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 broke up the Ottoman Empire into little uh, tiny Arab states and so they would fight each other, and they've been doing it ever since. All this was done in 1919. Now, our over there are fighting in Baghdad today. They have no idea why they're there or how they got there, but they're fighting for their lives, and they're being killed because of one man, Woodrow Wilson. He set up the policy of national self-determination, which no one understood then and no one understood now. And uh, national self-determination, apparently, uh, according to Washington, means having your country occupied by foreign power under military rule. So that's uh, self-determination. Well, actually, then, uh, you and I take a risk to even put this kind of truth out. Oh, it's very risky. They'll come right after you. In days that are not <laughs> unlike the days of Ezra Pound, then, is what oh, you're yeah. saying. Oh, yeah, same thing. The FBI opened a file on me in 1948, the first time I visited Ezra Pound. Now, I was a student at an art school in Washington, D.C. I had no interest in politics of any kind, but the FBI had a file on me because Ezra was accused of treason, and that is the most dangerous accusation that can be made against anybody. And, in fact, the accusation and indictment of Ezra Pound was handled by none other than Alger Hiss the personal president of Roosevelt, and uh, the personal uh, uh, representative of uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt in the White House. 
Uh-huh. So, um, <clears throat> so when Alger Hiss calls you a traitor, you got to think he knows what he's talking about. Now, of course, he's the most famous traitor in American history. We've come to a time, Eustace, where there's a new generation won't even know what we're talking about when we talk about Alger Hiss. You oh, not at all. When I went to Washington in 1948, everybody was talking about Alger Hiss. That was the subject everywhere you went. They were arguing pro and con for Alger Hiss. Of course, ladies and gentlemen, he's the man that was a convicted communist by, uh, partly by Richard Nixon, and that's what promoted him into politics uh, as far as presidential campaign material. Oh, yes, that made him presidential material. And um, Alger Hiss also is the father of the United Nations. He wrote the United Nations Charter in San Francisco in 1945. And um, today the president in the White House says we've got to go to the United Nations. Well, then it's quite an honor for you at an early age to be identified by him as a traitor then, wasn't it? Well, yes, that was a hand of fate. There's no question about it. Yes. And Washington has considered me a traitor since 1948. I served throughout World War II in the United States Army Air Force. And, of course, that's the last war we ever won. <laughs> I understand that. Well, then, uh, back on the subject of your, uh, uh, as the, what you call fate, you just sort of got into this fight for freedom by happening to go see Ezra Pound, then. Is that right? Uh, yes, I was the right place at the right time. Uh, and I've been there ever since. <laughs> and he started teaching you? He taught me three hours a day. I got an education that the whole world could envy. No one else has had it. Uh, because Ezra was not allowed to teach at an American university, so he went to Europe. And uh, American students have never had the benefit of Ezra Pound. I'm the only person in this country who has been personally educated by our greatest educator. What were some of the things he taught you? Uh, he taught me about the world conspiracy and uh, the fact that there is no nationalism. There's a, a secret world government that uh, rules all countries in the world. And uh, it's done through secret societies and cabals, cabala. And um, when we talk about representative government and democracy, well, we're talking hot air. There is no such thing and never has been. How did he learn that? Uh, he learned it by going to Europe as a young man and seeing firsthand the collapse of the old monarchies, and uh, they degenerated into what we have today, which is a government of secret societies. Interesting. Well, how many books have you written altogether, Eustace? Uh, Fifteen. I've got 38 more to write. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to get them in or not. Let's see. Uh, you've written 15, 38 more to write. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, he wrote a book that I never have gotten a hold of. I'd like to have one in my library. If any of you out there know how I could get one, I'd sure be interested. It's called The Biological Jew. And oh, uh, Pastor Peters, I found a copy uh, in my room, and I'm going to send it to you for a second for this. Oh, wonderful. I appreciate that so very I'm much. I'm glad you brought that up because I would have probably forgotten to tell you. But I'm going to get it off to you and send it off to you. Ladies and gentlemen, the book that I have in front of me that we've carried for several years, written by Eustace, one of which I, he's written uh, and that we carry, is Murder by Injection, subtitled The Story of the Medical Conspiracy Against America. Uh, what does this book retail?